Hello, I'm Hilary Hahn, and I'm here with... Paul Moravec. <laughs> and Paul, um, you're sitting in your study, and I can see that you have yep. a piano behind you. Yep. So, can you tell us about what you do? I'm a composer, <clears throat> and uh, this is my studio. I live on the Upper West Side, and uh, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> uh, what's today? It looks very bright. Uh, yeah, it's very bright it's, for nine o'clock in the morning. You know, I'm looking out uh, over Central Park here, or in that direction, and here comes the sun. So it's, it's just over the buildings there. So. Well, I'm in Madrid, and it's three p.m., and I have sun from a skylight. So it's funny. It feels like it's the same time of day, but it really isn't. <laughs> so I'm I'm talking to you because I know you from this project I've been doing, which is encore pieces that I've been premiering, and I premiered your piece, Blue Fiddle, um, this fall. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, I mean, I love playing the piece, but if you could talk a little bit about your experience writing it, or, you know, some, something you wanted to convey to the audience. Well, first of all, I was thrilled that you asked me to do this, <clears throat> and to be a part of this project. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, you asked uh, us to write, uh, as I recall, a four or five minute piece, and so I thought, well, what do I do in four minutes? And um, uh, I thought I had the idea of packing as much information as I can into those four minutes, and to also um, provide as much variety as I could, uh, and, and to show off what you do so well and uh, that is virtuoso passages, but also beautiful lyric passages as well. So th it has a kind of bipolar quality, this piece called Blue Fiddle, um, and it sort of alternates between these two moods. Do you think that's an apt description? I think so. I think it has a lot of variety in it. Yeah. Um, people probably ask you a lot about titles. It's very hard to come up with titles, I imagine. Is that the first thing or the last thing you do? It's usually the last, uh, you know, when I have a sense of what it's about. Um, and some titles are, for example, I just wrote a piece called uh, Wind Symphony, you know. <laughs> In a burst of inspiration, I, I came up with that, though, because that's what it is. It's a symphony uh, for a wind orchestra. Um, so some of these titles, uh, you know, are, are very clinical, and they simply describe what they are, string quartet, whatever. Um, but uh, as much as po if, if there's some kind of programmatic or, or if there's some kind of emotional uh, uh, resonance going on that reminds me of something, I, th then I give it a, a, a different title. In the case of Blue Fiddle, um, there, it has a kind of bluesy quality in some uh, in, in, in parts of it. You know, so I thought, well, okay, I'll make it a, a, a blue, and also it's a maybe uh, a reference to the red violin. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Take or a response to it in any event. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so the the fact that you feel like it references the blues, do you listen to a lot of non-classical music? Did you grow up with other genres? Sure. <clears throat> I'm an American. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> but my, my tastes are quite eclectic, and uh, I'm always discovering uh, or trying to discover new things. For example, right now I'm writing a, a piece for shakuhachi flute and string quartet, which is a commission from a Japanese organization. And um, <clears throat> so that's a whole new world that I, I don't know much about and, and I'm happily learning about as I write this piece. How do you learn something like that? I'm sorry? <clears throat> How do you go about learning something like that? Like learning the new language that you're working with? Well, in the case of writing for Shakuhachi, I'm working with the soloist. His name is uh, James uh, Scheffler. And um, so he, uh, we've had a couple of meetings where he comes by and shows me how, how it works and what works best on the, uh, on the Shakuhachi and so on. It's just like any other instrument, you know, I mean, in terms of writing for it. You learn as much as you can and then go to it. So what are your other projects right now? What are you working on? Uh, I'm going to be starting uh, my third opera soon, wow. uh, um, uh, which I can't announce yet for legal reasons, but I... <laughs> I'm not talking about it! 
I'll, I'll tell you later. Um, after this thing's on. Um, um, and uh, I'm writing a piano quartet and um, several vocal pieces. And I usually have uh, four or five projects going on at once um, mm -hmm. in my studio. Well, do you find that when you write for a certain group of instruments or a certain instrument or a certain type of piece, is it easier each time you write that same kind of thing, like a quartet? If you've written several quartets, then, you know, is it easier with every quartet that you write or like with operas? Operas are huge undertakings. Yeah, sure. Um, is yeah. each one different or do you, do they feed off of what came before? Um... In some ways, it's easier. In some ways, it's harder because it, uh, technically it's easier. I'm, I wrote my first opera for Santa Fe uh, a few years ago, and I had never written an opera before, so I was learning as I went. I was, it was on-the-job training. Yeah. I was very pleased with the results. Um, this, but the second opera was easier to write because I was already in the groove and I already had a sense of what works and what doesn't and, and, and so on. And I think, uh, you know, th that's true technically of just about anything. Uh, what makes it harder is that um, I never do anything twice or, or I try not to do anything twice. Mm -hmm. I don't like to repeat myself. So um, the, the hard part is being careful not to do that not to repeat myself. And so that, uh, in a certain sense, uh, uh, I do things by process of elimination. <laughs> you know, so, well, I haven't done this before. Let me try that. <laughs> so the first opera I did was a, you know, a real melodramatic, um, Tosca-like, you know, American Verismo, you know, blood and guts opera. Uh, very serious. And then the, uh, the one I did last year uh, is a comedy. Uh, basically a musical comedy, um, completely different. Uh, uh, and then the, the next one I do will be different again on another level. So. Well, taking it back to where you started, um, how did you start composing? What, what got you started? Uh, probably the Beatles got me started. When I... Uh, um, one of my earliest musical memories was seeing the Beatles uh, on the Ed Sullivan show. I was just a little whippersnapper. Um, and I just thought they were so cool. This was in 1964, <laughs> and I wanted to be a Beatle. Um, I didn't understand that you can't just sort of join them. You know, you have to. <laughs> um, uh, and my earliest compositions were songs. You know, I, I learned to play the guitar, and I wrote these sort of uh, folk songs. I was a big fan of Joni Mitchell and, you know, uh, that whole scene, Joan Baez, Judy Collins, and so on. Um, so my earliest compositions were sort of folk songs. And then uh, I was also a boy chorister uh, in the Episcopal tradition, so that was my, my, my real rigorous, you know, uh, uh, serious training. And uh, then I started writing... Uh, choral works and piano pieces because I was learning to play the piano as a kid as well. So I just sort of, you know, I like the idea of um, retreating into this world of imagination and uh, uh, that's how I got into writing. What is your writing process? Uh, chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> um, Does that help you that it's chaotic? No. Oh. <laughs> Well, I would imagine sometimes all these things, like if you have lots of ideas flying around, then right. you know it's kind of inspiring, maybe. Yeah, what I like to do is um, do lots of sketches and and uh, that are that are not attached to anything in particular, and then you know keep Beethoven did this, by the way. I mean, not not that I'm Beethoven, but it's an, it's a good way to. Um, uh, it's like keeping a journal of your ideas. You, know, you, dot, you jot down an idea, you put it away, and then you come back to it later and you say, oh, this will work well as a violin sonata, let's say, or, or you know, a symphony. Um, so I try to write every day, even if it's not connected to anything um, in particular. Um, because it, and I never throw anything away, because you never know 
when uh, a musical idea will be useful in some context that you didn't imagine it mm -hmm. would be. Um, <clears throat> and you know, the great thing about music is that it's fungible. That is, it can be used in, in any number of, uh, of contexts. This is not true of, of uh, written prose, for example. You know, once you write something in written prose, you can't use it again because it's so specifically you know, representational of what it is. But music, you know, all bets are off. You can, you can, you can use a musical idea in just about any new context, you know. And so with these different ideas that you store up, how do you keep track of them? Are they in notebooks? Are they filed? Uh, the, sorry? Are, are these ideas that you write down that you don't throw out, are they filed somewhere? Are they yeah. like yeah, I just in lost, notebooks? I lost, okay. Yeah. How and, do you find uh, them? Sorry? I would, I would completely lose them if I t just had them in notebooks. How do you find what you're looking oh, for? Oh, you know, they're just lying around. <laughs> <laughs> just open one. Okay, today I'm going to yeah, write like, this. Yeah, um, yeah pretty much. Um, and then when I get to writing uh, a specific piece, um, I write millions and millions and millions of sketches. And, just, uh, and, and um, for me... Uh, writing is all about revision. Um, as somebody once said, to err is human, uh, to revise divine. You know, and that's that's my attitude. You know, Schoenberg once referred to composition as uh, an incredibly slowed down improvisation, and I think that's an apt description. That is, um, <clears throat> in, in actual improvisation, jazz improvisation, you know, on the stage and so on. Um, that's one thing. Uh, but composition, written composition, uh, one advantage of that is that you uh, get to revise and refine the good ideas and then throw out the bad ones, you know, the things that aren't working. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and uh, thinking of it as a slowed down improvisation uh, also helps to uh, keep it spontaneous, you know, mm -hmm. on some level. Um, so... Uh, for me, um, uh, as I say, it, it, the process of composition is really about getting out the ideas, uh, putting them together, um, and uh, which, by the way, is what composition means. Compose means put together, um, and then revise. You know, endless revision. And sometimes I, I never stop revising. You know, I, I'm an inveterate reviser. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking that that is a lot like what they say about writing something like a novel. Yeah. You just, first draft, you have to get it all out. You can't yeah. be editing in the first draft. And then you just cut and cut and cut. And sometimes you have to cut out your favorite things because they aren't working for the whole context, but you can save them maybe for something else. Right. One thing yeah. becomes another thing later. Like something you cut turns into another work. I imagine it's, it, from what you're describing, it seems like it would be very similar with composition. Yeah. And Absolutely. all of this, you mentioned improvisation, do you write at the piano from playing? So you're kind of improvising playing and then you write down what you did? Right, yeah. Uh, I, I'm a, a visceral physical composer. I really need to work at the piano. It, um, of course, I can go out and go for walks and think about what I'm doing and so on. That's, that's important as well. But when it comes to the details, um, I think of musical composition in some ways as manual labor. Um, because for me, it's so much connected to playing the piano and my fingers find the way. You know? mm -hmm. and, and, and as I, I'm working out an idea, I, I will play that idea with, uh, say, a dozen variations until I get it right. But it's as though my hands are molding the, the, the piece into shape in a, strange, in a very physical, oddly physical way because it's, it's such, music is obviously abstract and invisible and it's sound waves in the air and so on. But my way of doing it is almost sculptural in a sense. Well, playing an instrument feels the same way. Yeah. Like you are creating through physical motions, you're creating a whole set of aural shapes that have nothing to do with the motions 
that you're actually doing, but you feel this, yeah, you feel like there are shapes. You're working with shapes. Right. It's hard to describe. It's not the shapes of the movements, but it's like, yeah. it's, like it's, it's like it's tangible, but where is it? You can't see it. You yeah. know, it's, it's strange. That way. Absolutely. And I think of a composition as a kind of energy field. You know, it's like in Star Trek when they go into these kind of energy fields and, and, and they're not really substantial, but they're sort of hovering, you know. Um, and that's what I think of as a, as a composition. That, and it will change and it will, it will, you can look at it from any number of angles and it's like a kinetic sculpture in a way. Mm -hmm. But I definitely think in terms of, of geometric shapes and so on. I mean, some compositions are jagged, and some are round, and some are smooth. And, yeah. Well, when you hear them, when you hear them later, after you've written them and you're on to another project, do you hear what you felt at the time you were writing, or can you hear it fresh? Um, it, it depends on uh, the quality of the work. I mean, some pieces are better than others. Um, <coughs> <clears throat> my um, the experience I like best is having finished the piece and going away from it for a while and it's in rehearsal and then you go to see it in the concert hall and, and I sit there and I think wow, this is pretty good I can't <laughs> wait to see how it ends you know, of course I know how it ends I, mean, I, I made it up and so on yeah. uh, that's the feeling I like, and and when that happens, I'm thrilled because um, I'm I'm I like to think that other people in the audience are having the same uh, sense of discovery and anticipation of you know what's going to come up and so on, and mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's a good feeling, and, and that does happen uh, on occasion, and, and that's a that, that's a nice thing. Um, on occasion, this, uh, on occasion keeps it going, right? I'm sorry? On occasion, keeps it going. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, for example, this comedy uh, opera that I wrote um, last year, uh, I was really worried about it, and uh, the rehearsal's very problematic and so on, and, and uh, I, I wasn't sure it worked at all. You know, it could have been a complete disaster, you know. So, and I got into the hall at the premiere, and it was spectacular, I thought. And, and I'm, I was sitting there, you know, applauding at the end of numbers, going, wow, <laughs> wow this is pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> and that's, that's, a, that's a nice sort of out-of-body experience, you know, for a composer. That's a good reward at the end of it, I think. Yeah, 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 it's a nice thing. Yeah. Well, one last question. When, yeah. when you're sitting in the audience and people don't yet know that you're the composer because no one has said, and here is the composer, Paul Moravec, you know, like, you're just a member of the audience. Do you hear people say things about your pieces as they're listening to them? Well, I, they don't talk during my pieces, is that what you mean? Well, that's good. No, but I mean as <laughs> in between movements or... Well, okay, so I used to play, and I still do sometimes, um, play at retirement communities and there were people there who had gone to concerts for 50 years and of course in between things I would hear very loud whisper comments on right. what had just happened and right. actually it was helpful because it was directly from what they were thinking to what I was hearing it wasn't edited for politeness or anything like that and um, so I was curious if you've had an experience of sitting there and then suddenly someone says something about the piece not realizing who you are. Yes, and I'm pleased to report, you know, they're generally positive comments. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> uh, that makes me feel good. You know, my um, whole mission as a composer basically uh, in abstract terms is first of all to make beautiful things. Mm -hmm. That's it. I mean, that, I'm in the business of making beautiful things as well as I can. Mm -hmm. Um, on a more practical level, I want to make useful things. I want my music to be used. I want to be a useful citizen, uh, a useful American, a useful citizen of the world, a useful member of the human race. And um, of course, I write for myself ultimately because I have to be the ultimate judge of, um, of what I put out there. 
Um, and I write for myself because, you know, making up music is just about the most fun thing in the world. I mean, <laughs> it's so great. And I'm, I'm privileged to have found a way to do this, you know, full time, 24 7. Um, but I want my music to be useful to people. And, uh, um, and that's something we don't think about enough as composers, I think, mm -hmm. these days. Anyway. So. See, I think that's really true. It's part of, it's a building block in the whole scene of art. But, you know, every person who contributes something, whatever kind of art it is, whether it's music or, um, you know, dance or video or, you know, film, I guess I should say, something like that, it's all woven in together. So I think even if people don't know each other's work, there are these connections between them and I can see how it seems like just a nice little sort of set of entertainment you know the arts but then at the same time it is really something that is kind of weaving this web of connections across the world right and in a sense useful is not just utilitarian but also you know, it has to do with the contribution that you're making is, is that how you feel oh sure absolutely and um, I think of myself as an artist, not an entertainer. And that might sound like a, an obvious statement, but it isn't. Because the, the experience of art is fundamentally, qualitatively different than entertainment. Um, I like to think that what I do is entertaining. That is, it holds your attention, it amuses you, etc. Uh, but... Um, um, the experience of art is about taking a person into themselves, whereas entertainment is about taking them out of themselves. And, and both experiences are important. Mm -hmm. uh, we need entertainment to uh, just escape, you know. Uh, and then we return to ourselves pretty much unchanged. The experience of art is qualitatively different because it's about taking us into ourselves and um, we are transformed. Uh, through a piece of, uh, uh, of, of great art. Um, mm -hmm. Right now I'm talking at the Philharmonic, I'm doing the, the, uh, the New York Philharmonic, I'm doing the pre-concert lectures, uh, and tonight we're doing, I'm doing, uh, they're doing Mahler's Ninth Symphony, so I'm, I'm talking about that, I'm getting immersed in this thing. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, one of those works that really transforms a person. You know, I mean, Mahler's Ninth really is a transformative artistic experience. Um, you can think of, you know, violin concertos that, or sonatas or whatever that have that, that same experience. I can, too. Um, you know, it, I, I, th I think it's true in America, when people think of uh, music, usually they're thinking in terms of entertainment. They're thinking of pop songs or whatever, and, and there are some great works of art among pop songs, don't get me wrong. Um, uh, but I think it would be great if people made uh, more of a distinction between the experience of entertainment and the experience of art. And I think that would help artists to be taken more seriously uh, in American society anyways. That's a really good point. I, I don't think people talk about that difference very often. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing to think about, though. Definitely. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. This has been a, a great pleasure and a great privilege. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Take care. Bye. Okay. So now what? What do we do 